Hello everyone, a uh, very very good evening and uh, welcome to Study IQ IAS English. I am Abhishek Singh and I am back with the next part of our India's Ancient Past by R.S. Sharma, this book series. And as you all might be aware that we are uh, doing this book series in a very comprehensive and a detailed manner with uh, keeping both the points analytical as well as factual in our minds so that we are fully prepared for the upcoming civil services examination in 2024. In case if you are willing to get more and more in-depth preparation, then you can also join our P2I batches which are going to start from the 22nd of July evening 6 p.m. obviously. In this batches, you are going to get a lots and lots of specific features. For example, you are going to get the comprehensive coverage of the general studies, current affairs, you are going to get the lots of test books, uh, textbooks as well. Along with that, in case if you are able to clear the prelims examination, you are going to get a call from our side to stay at our campus to get the access to the classes offline as well as your accommodation, food, etc. Everything will be provided to you from the side of Study IQ. And afterwards, you will be guided for the interview program as well. And this entire thing will be supplemented with the current affairs, with the success in prelims program, as well as with the with the specific guidance for the mains as well. So here, everything will be provided to you at a cost of rupees 29,999 rupees. But you have to use this code ASR Live in order to get this particular fees. Now, moving further to the topic. So the topic is basically the rise of the heterodox sect, heterodox religious sect as we were doing yesterday. Today, we are going to learn about the Jainism. Okay, good evening, Bulbul, Sarvend, Yadav, Mantasha, Sayyad. Very good evening to all of you. Guys, quickly share this session and inform your friends that the session has started. And I think that instead of uh, two successive live sessions, I have to shift the first session that is of answer writing to the 10 p.m. in night. That will be much better, right? Okay, but uh, today we are going to talk about, we are going to talk about the, you know, the more than 60 heterodox religious sect emerged during the later phase of the Vedic, cult Vedic culture, right, to resist the existing practices of the belief and faith. What does it mean? <coughs> what does it mean? As I told you that during later Vedic period, there was a, you know, extreme expansion of the slaughters, sacrifices, rituals and customs which are very complicated, which were actually exploiting the people which were draining the wealth of the people from the cattle, from the grains, right? All the form of the wealth that was being drained into the sacrificial pyres who were getting rich, Brahmins were getting rich, Kshatriyas were getting rich and the Vaish community who were, most, right, who were mostly the traders and merchants, they had to pay the taxes, they had to pay the gifts, they had to do the donations for the purpose of religious uh, religious practices such as the yagya etc and similarly the shudra who also used to pay the taxes even they had to provide the free labor they had to participate into this uh, activities even if they were not welcomed into it got it so that means overall the social structure was quite disturbed and this is why the group of people in fact, not at uh, once, but in the different time frames, the different people, they stood up, they rose up in the protest of ongoing, ongoing cultural practices. And such people in the different time period, they were known differently. For example, there was a one ideology called as the Shashwatvadi, called as Shashwatvadi. All right, everyone. So, this Shaswatwadi ideology, what was the feature of that Shaswatwadi ideology? They believed that, they believed that everything is Shaswat. Shaswat means permanent. Shaswat means permanent. Nothing is, destru nothing is destroyed. Everything is indestructible. Everything is permanent. All right. Who, perp right, who perpetuated this policy? This ideology was perpetuated by, propagated by Pakura Kachayan, Pakura Kachayan. And what did he say exactly? 
his principle was very simple that whatever you think that is getting destroyed whatever you think that is getting perished it's not like that it's just the shape that's just the form which is getting changed here guys it seems impossible to us right now but when i will give you the analogy of the creation energy of the energy right so we understand right we just have to understand it that there are certain elements which cannot be destroyed right neither be created nor be destroyed what is that element about which we study in science as well tell me the answer that what is that which cannot be created cannot be destroyed okay everyone now uh, manoj b so you can right you can uh, definitely uh, access to the right access to the slides on my telegram channel that i will be providing the link of that telegram channel uh, at the end of the session and yes definitely i have started to cover the ancient history and after that i will be moving to the medieval and modern but after ancient first of all we will do the right modern part and then we will move to the medieval part okay everyone so definitely energy is something we we actually have studied in the in the you know the first law of thermodynamics okay so that there is basically right there is basically no dissipation sorry there is basically no creation or no destruction only the dissipation takes place the change in the form takes place this principle is essentially saying the same thing after that there is another principle called as the anishchayvadi anishchayvadi this was propounded by sanjay belatiputta sanjay belatiputta sanjay belatiputta what does he have to say what does he have to say he says that that uncertainty is the only truth right another scientific principle yeah, recently in fact today only i was just uh, going through a random article and i found that heisenberg's uncertainty principle was mentioned into that suddenly what clicked into my mind that there was a philosopher whose name was sanjay that philosopher sanjay he says that only the uncertainty is the biggest and the most certain aspect of this universe how philosophical how philosophical uncertainty is the most certain aspect of this universe all right everybody so here we can say one thing here we can say one thing that this principle this principle of uncertainty it also tried to indicate that why are you guys fighting against each other right if you are thinking that you will capture this mahajanpad and become the samrat of that this is absolutely uncertain it's not for permanent not for ever it's not for ever okay so that means whichever efforts you are putting into the fighting you have to stop those efforts immediately guys ultimately the target of all these uh, different philosophical explanations different philosophical ideologies all these had the same target the target was to to persuade the people who were constantly fighting the different wars into not fighting these many wars to persuade the people to maintain the peace and tranquility to persuade the people to maintain equality and uh, to treat the people with respect why as i told you in the previous lecture that all the all the changes which were being introduced in the society or which were tried to be introduced in the society all those changes they were directly the need of the hour the need of the hour okay so whenever whenever any specific situation arises in the society we come to the solution part due to that problem only the problem finds its own solution right everyone so here the problem was ongoing vedic complications rituals customs traditions sacrifices right loss of loss of the animal wealth and so many things here all these are preaching all these are preaching to maintain the non violence to maintain the peaceful 
conduct all these are preaching to not worry about gaining the extra wealth extra territory etc etc ajivikas okay ajivika sect was initiated by mokhali goshal and he believed in the fortuneism what is this fortuneism fortune indicates the luck okay luck or bhagya so whenever whenever we talk about the ajivikas ajivikas they believe that nothing more than your fortune and nothing before the time okay nothing before the proper time and nothing more than the deserving luck is ever is ever obtained by you so you cannot get anything which is not there in your luck and you cannot anything before the time which is already already determined by the nature okay so ultimately ajivikas are saying that that do not okay do not stress yourself okay for karma do not stress yourself for karma that means do not force yourself to do something which has not to be done why because no matter how much effort do you put into that you are not going to get that result which is not there into your fortune into your luck it sounds very passive it sounds very passive right but uh, this is this is also the reality at any extent if you observe it at an extent if you observe it because there is definitely some factor that if we are working even if we are working really hard even if we are putting all the efforts there are some factors which are not in our hands which are not under our control and those factors can lead the undesirable consequences in our life for example somebody is very well prepared very well prepared for this examination and goes to goes to write the answer okay goes to write the answer get to a center of examination in such a way in such a way where <coughs> there is a you know all there is all great facility which is available for that person now suppose you are writing suppose you are writing nobody knows that from where uh, an insect comes and and stings you and bites you and due to that you suddenly what do you do you suddenly get you know reactive and due to that reaction part the entire pen is just slashed right is just slashed on your answer book so complete page of your answer is it is simply cut off now who is responsible for that nobody that insect cannot be blamed and your one complete answer is simply strike off okay it is simply struck off so here you are wasting your time also here you are able to not cover that mental agony will be there so other answers will be impacted and this single mistake can hamper your result in the mains examination right so if it is uh, going to happen so it can happen anything right ajivika as were also making sense lokayata or charvak principle what was that the founders of this philosophy included brihaspati all right the most initial founder of the lokayata sect and the ajit kesh kambalin was also there ajit kesh kambalin also founded the or promoted the charvak sect what is this charvak sect by the way charvak sect is a, a very important sect to understand because this sect talked about this philosophy talked about the materialistic approach about the physical world about the significance of the physical world at a time when everybody was talking about the spirituality everybody was talking about the other world about the desire of nirvana moksha salvation but lokayata sect was talking about talking about the materialistic approach it said that there is no god there is no existence no proof of any god why are you worried about your karma about your 
next birth, about your previous birth, about uh, salvation, whatever is there, it is in this world only. This world will, this world will have the direct consequences of your actions. Whatever you are doing today, you will have to bear the consequences tomorrow. Okay? So, do not worry about the life after the death because there is nothing after the death. If you really want to ensure your goodwill, you have to make this life beautiful. Make this life substantial and content. Okay? So, that is a very good philosophy. Right? Because Charvak simply said that, that this is the body that you have got and you have to worship your body. You have to make your body fit and healthy and content enough, your mind fit and healthy and content enough, only then you can stay happy. You cannot stay happy by getting worried about the salvation that after what will happen after your death. Okay? So, that is a very popular group of philosophies which were prevalent during the 6th century BC. But other than these philosophies, two most popular philosophies were including Jainism and Buddhism. In fact, the entire 6th century period, that was the age of philosophies. As I told you that the agrarian, the agrarian revolution, the agrarian revolution which led to the increase in the in the food production in the food production and therefore sustaining right therefore sustaining the growing cities okay growing cities and when the cities were growing which means the prosperity that was there okay so guys remember one point remember one very simple point good evening asha that when there is the prosperity, when there is prosperity, what is the result of that? A prosperous person is free-minded person. A prosperous person is able to think freely, is able to, you know, put down certain philosophies of the life. Only two things in the life, they can make you philosopher. The first one is a peaceful, prosperous life that you are living. Then you can do the commentary, you can give the lectures to everybody, you can tell the realities and the facts related to the life. Right, the first condition. Second condition, if you are facing a lot and lot of trouble, if you are continuously struggling in your life, if you are always a failure, still, still you have not considered yourself a failure, if you are continuously striving, working really hard to obtain or to achieve your result, achieve your goals, then also you can become a philosopher, then also you can guide and you know preach the philosophies to different people. Here, the first case was there. This time period in the Indian history was the time period of the growth of second phase of urbanization. People were having money, money, right? People were having prosperity, peace of mind, they had the full stomach, no problem of the grains, etc. So, they had nothing else but to think about the life. And when they thought about the life, their thought was, their thought was based upon two different sources. The first, where they used the Vedas as the source of the knowledge, as the source of entire entire thought process. So, where they used the Vedas as the source of the entire thought process, that type of thought process, that type of philosophy, it was called as, it was called as the Astic philosophy. What was the name? Astic philosophy. Remember the point always, remember this point always that Astic does not mean, it does not mean that you believe in the God. Astic means that you believe in the Vedic supremacy. You believe in the Vedic supremacy or Vedas as the supreme source of the knowledge. All right? Because let me tell you, let me tell you that even the Sankhya philosophy does not believe in the God. Right? Does not believe in the God. 
it does not talk about uh, the single creator of the entire universe rather it talks about the it talks about the prakriti and purush the two permanent aspects of the still energy and the and the random form of energy okay the minute form of this energy which is present in each and every element of the universe and the outish nature the physical aspect the physical formations of the universe okay so the minute and still form of energy which is present in every single aspect every single component of the universe in the invisible form that is called as the purush and what is prakriti the dimensional growth of the energy formations with the help of the materialistic aspects around us surrounding in the universe that is called as the prakriti that is called as the prakriti so what is speaking inside me what is making me conscious what is a instillate what is instilling me with the vigor with the vigor with the valor with the existence that is the purush and what is giving me the shape what is making me to appear in front of you what is giving me the actions the expressions what is giving me the identity what is giving me the capacity and formations to use the use that energy that is the prakriti right this is what the sankhya philosophy says about the universe okay and there was the yoga philosophy by patanjali nyaya philosophy by gautam vaisheshik philosophy by kanar and mimamsa philosophy by jaimini vedanta philosophy by badrayan mimamsa is also called as the purva mimamsa and vedanta is also called as the uttar mimamsa all these philosophies they find the vedas as the source of their entire thought process this is why they are called as the astic philosophy okay talking about the nastic philosophy so nastic philosophy basically includes the heterodox philosophies which do not treat the vedas as the supreme source of knowledge okay the propounders the propounders of the astic philosophy they are called as the brahmans those who support those who believe those who preach those who no those who uh, spread this philosophy they have been called as the brahmans those who obtain the knowledge from the brahm brahm means the supreme you know, the supreme being right so those who obtain the knowledge from the brahm they are called brahman brahman and those who don't believe those who don't believe that vedas are supreme rather they do the rather they do all the efforts by their own by their own they do the meditation concentration they do the hard right hard efforts and then obtain the knowledge they are called as they are called as a shraman they are called as a shraman all right everybody they are called as a shraman okay so that is a very important point that you need to understand who were shramanas who were the brahmanas this question was asked even in the upsc prelims examination in the statement form <coughs> okay so today we are going to talk about the two very important religions uh, religious teachers the first one about whom we are going to talk today he is vardhaman mahavir swami okay vardhaman महावीर स्वामी ओके एवरीवन नाउ द अदर पिक्चर इंडिकेट्स महात्मा बुद्ध और लॉर्ड गौतम बुद्ध हियर देयर इज अ ब्रीफ इंट्रोडक्शन अबाउट जैनिज्म एंड वर्धमान महावीर स्वामी सो ही वाज बोर्न एज पर आर एस शर्मा इन 540 बीसी एंड डाइड इन 468 बीसी however the latest the latest books they mention that he was born in 599 bc and he died in 527 bc okay 
so this is birth and this is death as per latest books for example upinder singh talks about this timeline this timeline okay so mahavir was born in a kundgram near vaishali in a kshatriya family and his father was siddharth mother was trishala who was the sister of lichvi chief chetak lichvi chief chetak right everyone what is lichvi lichvis were one of the royal families of the vajji mahajanpad right vajji mahajanpad in the today's area of vaishali in bihar he married yashoda and gave birth to a daughter and he died at the age of 72 years at the pavapuri at the pavapuri near rai aheria right rai aheria rai aheria okay so rai aheria is basically the current the current place in the very proximate district right so that area of the mall mahajanpad in the 6th century bc that area had two different capitals the one capital was kushinara the another capital was pavapuri so in the second capital pavapuri mahavir swami died his teachings are summarized here so teachings include the three ratnas right faith right knowledge right conduct and these three ratnas can be obtained through the five doctrines or the five great woes okay five great woes which are those great woes by the way these great woes also known as the panch anuvratas and sorry panch mahavratas okay panch mahavratas okay these panch mahavratas include do not commit violence that is uh, ahimsa do not commit uh, do not speak a lie that is a satya do not steal aste do not acquire property that is aparigrah and observe the continence that is brahmacharya right so this is about the basic informations related to the teachings of vardhaman mahavir so he recognized the existence of god but lower than the jin jin means jin means the tirthankar okay now talking about the jainism in little bit detail in little bit detail okay so jainism is probably one of the most ancient religious traditions in our country in fact ncrt suggests that vardhaman mahavir was the founder however if we go by the tradition or even if we go by the historical historical timeline then also we come across the number of tirthankaras right so in jainism in jainism there is a concept of there is a concept of time cycle okay time cycle in jainism we do not have we do not have the linear scale of time we do not have the linear scale of time like currently we are following the we are following the linear scale of time where if anything happened once then it's gone forever it's gone forever but in jainism even in the ancient hinduism also you have this cyclic form of the time okay which is represented with the help of the sinusoidal curves right sinusoidal curves so in the different phases in the different phases you find the phase of uh, rise and progress and the phase of digress the phase of digress okay so here what happened that in each and every phase each each and every phase there is the birth there is the birth of a person who obtains the supreme stage of the life and and he preaches the basic teachings of the universe and that person becomes known as tirthankar he becomes and becomes known as tirthankar so this is the concept of the tirthankar in the jainism okay so a tirthankar is there in the each time cycle each phase of the time cycle in the jainism so till today we have seen that there have been 24 such personalities 24 such personalities who have 
redefined the basic teachings which are essential for the maintenance of serenity and sanctity to the human beings as per the Jainism. Right? This includes a list starting from Rishabh Dev, starting from the Rishabh Dev and, right, and goes up to, right, goes up to Vardhaman Mahavir, Vardhaman Mahavir. All right, everybody. So, Vardhaman Mahavir was, Vardhaman Mahavir was 24th Tirthankar, 24th Tirthankar. Okay. So, being the 24th Tirthankar, it is obviously, it is obviously, uh, have, we have to believe that Vardhaman Mahavir, whatever he had preached, it was probably the last set of preachings of the Jainism. Okay. That is why at present, he is regarded as the, as the supreme lord of Jainism under the current cycle of time. This is why his teachings are considered to be the most uh, you can say venerated and most significant for the Jainism. Right, everybody? So, what are his teachings and why were other Tinthankaras not considered uh, as the historical figures at least uh, at present? Because we do not have the evidences which suggest the existence of more than, more than two Tirthankaras. Only two Tirthankars have been considered by the historians to be the real personalities or real historical people. And apart from Mahavir Swami, who was obviously a historical person, apart from him, the 23rd Tirthankara, whose name was Parshwanath, Parshwanath, he is also regarded as a real person who was the son of, who was the son of the king of Varanasi, Right, whose name was Ashwasen. Ashwasen. Okay, so we can see that we can see that both the Tirthankaras, who are historical personalities, they were born in the families of the Kshatriyas. In the families of the Kshatriyas. All right, everybody. Right. So in the previous day's lecture, we had studied about the different types of the reactions taking place among the Kshatriya society against the Brahmanical dominance and this information, it further, it further strengthens the case, further strengthens the case. Now, when we talk particularly about Vardhaman Mahavir, so he belonged to the, he belonged to the Gyatrik clan of the Kshatriyas and had the connection to the royal family of Magad. How did he has the connection with the royal family of Magad? Because the Magad, okay, the Magad and the Vaishali, okay, these two were related, these two were related. How? The Vaishali was ruled by Lichvis, ruled by Lichvis, okay, and the Lichvi princess, right, Lichvi princess was, okay, princess was married married to Bimbisara okay Bimbisara so Lichvi princess was married to Bimbisara and another Lichvi princess was married to right princess was married to King Siddharth, King Siddharth, whose name was, what was the name of the princess? Trishala, okay, Trishala. All right, everybody. So, we can say that, we can say that the King Chetak, the King Chetak, whose, right, whose sister was married to, whose sister was married to, uh, in the house of, in the house of Siddharth, and her uh, daughter was married to the house of Bimbisara. So, indirectly he became relative of the Magad royal province. Okay, Magad Mahajanpat. Also, he was relative of the Vaishali or the Vridji Mahajanpat. So, overall, he belonged to a very affluent 
family, very affluent ambience. Now, his father Siddharth was the head of the Gyatrik clan and his mother Trishala was the sister of Chetak, the king of Vaishali. At the age of 30 years, he renounced his home and become an ascetic. So, at the age of 30 years, he decided to leave the home. And why so? Because he had that intuition. He had that intuition to leave the home behind. And he decided to completely renunciate every single materialistic connection, including his cloths. Including his cloths. All right. So, he practiced austerity for the 12 years and attained the highest spiritual knowledge called the Kaivalya. Okay. Called the Kaivalya. So, after the austere life for 12 long years, he was finally in the state of mind where he could realize the truth of the life and he became, he became the Mahavir. He became Mahavir. Why? Because he had defeated all the, all the meticulous, uh, all the, uh, you can say mediocre form of the desires, all the meticulous actions which were occurring, everything was won over by Mahavir. And he was also known as the Jinendriya, Jinendriya, who had achieved the victory over the victory over the Indriya or, or the, you know, sensu, right, the sensory organs, the sensory organs, which means that his senses were completely under his control. Right? You can say that he had become a Siddh Purush, something like that. So, therefore, he was called by the name Jinendri or Jin or Jin or also known as the Mahavir and his followers, since he was called as the Jin or Jinendri, his followers were called as the Jain. The followers of Jin, Jain. Okay. So, that is how the followers got the name. So, he delivered his first sermon at Pava. At Pava, that is the same place where he will die. A symbol was associated with the every Tirthankar in the Jainism tradition and the symbol of Mahavira that is lion. Okay, that is a lion. Remember that. Apart from that, we can say that he was also, he was also, uh, you know, vivid traveler who, who was an avid traveler who used to travel across the different regions only on his own feet. Only on his own feet. Alright. Here, the Koshal Mahajanpad, Magad Mahajanpad, Mithila, uh, Mithila, that was a republic, then Champa, that was the capital of Anga Mahajanpad. All these areas were covered by him on the feet, on the feet. So, the walking journey that took him to the various places. All right. However, if we talk about the <coughs> right, origin of the Jainism originally, so it came into the prominence during the 6th century BC when the Lord Mahavira propagated this religion. All right. And the 24 great teachers, also known as the Tirthankaras, who had attained all the knowledge while living and preached it to the people. The first Tirthankara was Rishabhanath that we had already discussed. Followers were called Jain, that is also we have discussed. Now, what are the teachings of the Jainism tenets? So, tenets of Jainism, the first one that is they believe in the God. They believe in the God. They do not deny the existence of God. They say that yes, God is there, but God is not the supreme creator because there is no question of the creation. Everything is just, you know, getting repeatedly, repeatedly shifted from one form to the other form and this is the result of the cyclic time, free, time frame. Okay. Did not condemn the Varna system, but attempted to mitigate the evils of the Varna order and ritualistic Vedic religion. Here, Jainism did not directly criticize the Varna system. Rather, it associated the Varna system as a result of the actions or the karmas of the previous birth. That's the point, very, very important point. Apart from that, Mahavira, a person is born, right, according to him, a person is born in the higher or the lower Varna as the consequence of the sins or the virtues in the previous birth. Okay? As I told you, Jainism says that it is your soul, it is your soul which acquires, acquires the load of the sins or the load of the virtues. Okay? The sins means pap and virtues means punya. 
सो वट एवर एक्शन यू कंडक्ट वट एवर एक्शन यू कमिट दैट हैज अ सर्टेन रिजल्ट दैट रिजल्ट माइट बी फेवरेबल फॉर यू माइट बी अनफेवरेबल फॉर यू इफ दैट इज फेवरेबल दैट विल प्रोवाइड यू द पुण्य ओके दैट विल टेक यू टूवर्ड्स द लिबरेशन एंड इफ दैट एक्शन इज नॉट फेवरेबल फॉर यू दैट विल टेक यू टू द to the bindings to the bounds and that will be a pap so this is how you are deciding through your actions you are deciding your next birth or your status of the soul that you are having so ultimately jainism believed jainism believed in the god it believed in the soul it believed in the salvation okay so god is there soul is there salvation is there trans migration of the soul and theory of karma that is also present into the jainism into the jainism jainism told that if you are willing to get rid of the right of the malicious impact of the karma then you have to follow the principles of three ratna three ratna or three gems of the jainism what are those three gems by the way right faith right knowledge right action that is the samyak darshan samyak gyan samyak charit all right and as i told you that these three are possible to be followed by ahimsa satya aste aparigraha and brahmacharya the meaning of which i have already told to you in the very beginning itself so these basic tenets they are supplemented by the several philosophies in the jainism the jainism has got a few important philosophies for example anekantavad what is anekantavad the multilateralism or theory of plurality it says that it says that there are multiple there are the multiple aspects of the truth of the true knowledge of the true knowledge okay multiple aspects of the true knowledge which means that a person must be person must be open to accept the ultimate truth and the reality because the ultimate truth and reality they are complex and they might have the multiple aspects for example if somebody is trying to search the meaning of life the meaning of life can be different for the different people and everybody has the you know own experience about the meaning of life so all of them are correct all of them are correct okay for somebody life is a game for somebody life is a race for somebody life is an opportunity and all of them are true so that means the ultimate reality will be something which will be having all these multiple aspects of the actual truth so that is basically the anekantavad what is the syadvad syadvad is basically the theory of the qualified assertion that means if there is a truth if there is a truth or if there is an existence of something there might be the possibility that the alternative could also exist okay the alternative could also exist so this is basically called as the assertion of the possibilities assertion of the possibilities for example for example suppose if there is a statement there is a statement that have you done your work perhaps you answer will be perhaps because i consider that yes i have done my work but since that work was assigned by you so ultimately you are the one who is going to decide whether that work is complete or not and suppose if you say that the work is not completed then my statement will become a false statement which will be invalid as per the philosophy of jainism right because jainism forbids speaking the speaking the lie or telling a lie so that is why i am using this perhaps i have done the work so that if you are going to check it and if this is not completed as per your consideration then you can tell me and i will say that yes i had told you that perhaps it is completed because there was definitely some scope 
of the incompletion as per your standards right so ultimately the syadavad it it basically provides a uh, right provides a statement or an assertion which is true only in the specific circumstances specific circumstances which means that the truth is the truth is always a qualified truth which means that if something which is i am saying today may not be correct tomorrow all right may not be correct tomorrow and that's a very 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 liberal idea very open minded idea this principle can resolve the maximum number of problems in the world okay because many things which we are considering the true right now the truth right now might not be true for example in the 14th century 13th century the people were thinking that the earth is stationary and the sun is rotating or revolving around it and those who said that this is not true they were punished because 99% people believed that yes this is the truth but was that the truth of course not okay so apart from that if we talk about the various sect or divisions in the jainism the jainism got divided into two different or two major sect called as the digambar and shvetambar as the name suggests digambar the monks of this sect believe in the complete nudity that means dig means what dig right dig that means the directions okay directions and ambar ambar in sanskrit means the cloth so only the directions from all the sides have covered the body of somebody like a cloth that is why the person is wearing the wearing the air wearing the directions that means he is wearing nothing okay digambar they follow all the five woes satya ahinsa astya parigraha and brahmacharya as given by mahavir swami okay they also believe that women cannot achieve the liberation because for them it is impossible to follow the brahmacharya as per jainism sambhuti vijay all right everyone and his disciple bhadrabahu they were the exponents of this sect who was sambhuti vijay remember that mahavir swami okay mahavir swami he had his 11 chief disciples 11 chief disciples okay who were called as ganadharas who were called as the ganadhar okay now if i am talking about uh, the last two ganadharas okay so last two ganadharas they included susharman okay susharman and sambhuti vijay and sambhuti vijay all right so when we talk about sambhuti vijay he was the last shrut kevalin okay last shrut kevalin however however this is as per the belief of the shvetambar sect the digambars believe that it was bhadrabahu digambars believed that it was bhadrabahu who was the disciple of sambhuti vijay okay that he was the he was the last shrut kevalin another disciple another disciple whose name was whose name was sthul bhadra right sthul bhadra he will be coming later in the time and he will be a young monk young monk unlike bhadrabahu who was a seasoned and old monk right bhadrabahu will be abiding by the basic principles of the jainism when there will be when there will be the distress or the time of famine in the magadh empire however however he have to move towards the southern india particularly in the karnataka region particularly in the karnataka region so therefore the migration of the migration of uh, bhadrabahu bhadrabahu towards karnataka 
towards Karnataka to right to save the Digambar Digambar monks from the famine. Okay, from the famine that was okay that was not supported by right not supported by the another leader another monk whose name was Asthul Bhadra okay who was comparatively a younger monk and he started wearing he started wearing white cloth white cloths as per the changing time he changed the system of clothing and this is why the digambars digambars and shwetambars okay they became the two different two different segments okay shwetambars all right everybody so this is about right this is about the digambar and shwetambar the digambaras are further subdivided into the mool sang bisa panth tera panth and taran panth or samaya panth so this question has been asked in the upsc prelims examination then swetambars they wear white cloth only four woes are followed brahmacharya is not compulsory for swetambars therefore even the women can achieve the salvation as per the swetambars and who was the founder sthul bhadra was the founder of this sect here the major subsect include the murti pujak sthanak vasi and thera and thera panthi okay thera means thera means the okay disciples or you know the basically the monks okay talking about the spread of the jainism you can understand it one point that mahavira organized the order of his followers where he allowed both men and women but women could not attain salvation that's the point jainism did not very clearly separated itself from the brahmanical culture therefore gradually in right it had to shift towards the western india and southern india because in magadh region or in the northern india the brahmanical culture was already very strong so people could not segregate between the jainism and brahmanism but in southern india in the western india the brahmanical culture was not that much strong this is why the jainism started to flourish in those areas the famine story in magadh as i told you that famine actually lasted for 12 years and therefore when uh, bhadrabahu he was not you know they were they were the wearers of no cloth so they had to migrate to such a place where they could survive in a little bit better climate better weather conditions so they decided to migrate towards the south and there there what happened they were actually right they were actually migrating towards the south via the route of kaling or odisha and further reaching to the shravan belgola in the karnataka region near mysuru okay and that area is obviously very cool and uh, having a great and pleasant climate talking about the jain council so the jain council actually it was right organized as the first jain council and second jain council twice okay so the first council was held at patliputra in 3rd century bc where sthul bhadra became the chairperson and he declared that shwetambaras are the real jainis and digambaras are out okay so shwetambara digambar the division took place in the first jain council held at patliputra okay second jain council occurred at vallabhi in 512 ad presided by presided by devardhi kshamashraman and what was the main work done here the main work was the decision about the final epics and literary works related to the jainism so overall 12 angas and 12 upangas were compiled at the vallabhi conference in gujarat and remember the vallabhi in that time it was the capital of the maitrak dynasty maitrak dynasty of gujarat in the 6th century bc that's a very very important point okay talking about the jain literature here the jain literature consists of the agam sutras and the non agam sutras agam literature is basically related to the sacred books of the jain religion written in the ardha magadhi 
दैट इज अ सब टाइप ऑफ प्राकृत ओके एंड नॉन आगम लिटरेचर इट कंसिस्ट ऑफ द कमेंट्री एंड द एक्सप्लेनेशन ऑफ द आगम लिटरेचर एंड इंडिपेंडेंट वर्क कंपाइल्ड बाई द डिफरेंट स्कॉलर डिफरेंट स्कॉलर ओके नॉन आगम लिटरेचर इज अवेलेबल इन मेनी लैंग्वेजेस रीजनल लैंग्वेजेस मेनली कन्नड़ा राजस्थानी ओके मराठी गुजराती तमिल हिंदी इंग्लिश संस्कृत एनीथिंग बट द मेन वर्क द एक्चुअल वर्क दैट इज आगम लिटरेचर ऑफ जैनिज्म दैट इज इन द अर्ध मागधी लैंग्वेज ऑल राइट सो गाइज ओवरऑल वी कैन से दैट जैनिज्म बेसिकली इट वॉज एन एफर्ट टू रिफॉर्म द एविल्स ऑफ द वर्णा ऑर्डर एंड प्रमोटेड द ग्रोथ ऑफ द लैंग्वेजेस लाइक प्राकृत एंड कन्नड़ एट द सेम टाइम आर्किटेक्चर लिटरेचर स्कल्पचर आर्ट एवरीथिंग वॉज अफेक्टेड बाई द ग्रोथ ऑफ जैनिज्म एंड एट द सेम टाइम टिल टूडे द बिगेस्ट सपोर्टर ऑफ द नॉन वायलेंस द बिगेस्ट सपोर्टर ऑफ द पीसफुल को एग्जिस्टेंस द बिगेस्ट सपोर्टर ऑफ द काइंड एंड काइंडनेस एंड मर्सी टूवर्ड्स द लिविंग बींग्स दैट हैज बीन द जैनिज्म एज अ रिलीजियन ओके so even today you will find the largest number of the donate right largest number of those, those people who are generally donating the you know money or generally uh, doing the charity works or generally uh, safeguarding the living beings they are mostly from the jain community okay everybody so we can say we can say that the principles of jainism they are much more applicable today especially if we are we are willing to restore the global peace and prosperity okay everyone however both the religions they emerged together jainism and buddhism but they have certain differences like jainism it recognizes uh, recognizes the god whereas buddhism did not recognize jainism does not condemn the varna system but buddhism does condemn Jainism believed the transmigration of the soul. For example, Jainism says that the karma is uh, you know relied upon your soul and it will be given to the next birth. However, Buddhism simply discards the existence of the soul. It talks about the next birth, but not because of the soul, because of the unfulfilled desires. Buddhism says that middle path is the best philosophy, whereas the Jainism talks about the extremities of penance, the extreme ways of life. giving the pain to yourself and choosing the death by salekhana by torturing self yourself that is how the jainism became very difficult to be followed not the cup of everyone's okay not the everyone's cup of tea so that's the point all right everyone so guys i hope that this session was definitely informative and useful for all of you for more such information and the complete guidance you can join our p2y batches the information about which is available on the application you can go and download the application of study iq ias or you can also click the link given in the comment box to know more about it so thank you so much for watching it let's meet tomorrow and for the purpose of uh, getting the ppt and pdf of this class you can join the telegram group by this link or you can simply scan this bar uh, this qr code to join my group thank you so much guys for watching it take care bye bye let's meet tomorrow and jai hind